First Chronicles chapter 29, First Chronicles. If you are trying desperately to remember a Bible book song in your head right now to go through and remember where is First Chronicles, I'm sure you're not alone. First Chronicles, sort of in the middle of the Old Testament. If you find some books labeled First and Second Samuel and then First and Second Kings, and after that'll be First and Second Chronicles. It's before Psalms. First Chronicles. We're seizing a moment this morning in light of our renewal of our generation project, which we will launch again next month on September 11th, to receive from a passage of scripture that I think is is probably often neglected, not often studied, as, as sadly First Chronicles often can be, but is extremely valuable to us. First Chronicles, if you're not familiar with the book, was written a, about a, a hundred years or so after God's people had returned from exile. So if you know the kind of the Old Testament story, They were in the promised land after Egypt. They rebelled against God and over a series of many, many years and many, many kings and wickedness, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the Babylonian empire, came and and conquered Jerusalem, took people out of the land, and then some were allowed to return under the Persian king Cyrus. They began building the temple. That's the mid-500s B.C. That's about 500 years before the birth of Christ, and then... About a hundred years later, the temple has been rebuilt and the people are there living in a, in a severely weakened condition and so First Chronicles comes into them in that situation. It tells them stories of the past to seek to inspire them in the present. So let's read this passage written to those returned exiles living in the land and let's try to be inspired ourselves this morning. First Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 1. And David the king said to all the assembly, Solomon my son, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. And the work is great, for the palace will not be for man, but for the Lord God. So I have provided for the house of my God, so far as I was able, the gold for the things of gold, the silver for the things of silver, and the bronze for the things of bronze, the iron for the things of iron, the wood for the things of wood, besides great quantities of onyx and stones for setting, antimony, colored stones, all sorts of precious stones and marble. Moreover, in addition to all that I have provided for the holy house, I have a treasure of my own, of gold and silver, and because of my devotion to the house of my God, I give it to the house of my God. 3,000 talents of gold, of the gold of Ophir, and 7,000 talents of refined silver for overlaying the walls of the house, and for all the work to be done by craftsmen, gold for the things of gold and silver for the things of silver, who then will offer willingly consecrating himself today to the Lord. Then the leaders of the father's houses made their free will offerings, as did also the leaders of the tribes, the commanders of thousands and of hundreds, and the officers over the king's work. They gave for the service of the house of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. And whoever had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord in the care of Jehiel the Gershonite. Then the people rejoiced because they had given willingly. For with a whole heart they had offered freely to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. Therefore, David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. 
And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own we have given you. For we are strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no abiding. O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things, and now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. Grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart, that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, performing all, and that he may build the palace for which I have made provision. Lord, bless the preaching and the fulfilling of your word. Amen. Why do we tell true stories about our heritage? Why do British children in the older days hear stories of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and hear the legend that perhaps one day King Arthur will return? Why did Lincoln begin his Gettysburg Address with the words four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation? Why did he start that way? What's the purpose of it? Why do we tell stories about the soldiers storming Omaha Beach or Iwo Jima? Why, why is it fun to hear stories about our grandfather or our dad? I remember when I was a kid hearing my dad tell about when my grandfather was much younger and how fast he could run. And his awe of watching him chase around the yard after the dog. What he had done in high school, in his high school race team. Why do we tell stories about the past? And, and why is this writer writing so many centuries after these events writing these down for these people that have returned from Babylon and their descendants and they're living there in the land. Why is he doing this? Well, it's because stories of our heritage inspire us in the present. They, they create a connection with who we once were in the hopes that we can be that again. They, they remind us of something in the past so that we can be motivated to not lose track of what has happened before and so that we can desire to see that again. And that's especially true of the people of God. That's especially true. Again and again, books of the Bible are written and they, they chronicle what happened in the past but with the goal of motivating us in the present. And, and First and Second Chronicles are no exception. You may notice if you've done your Bible reading a, a slight difference in reading First and Second Kings which covers a lot of the same narrative and First and Second Chronicles. That's because they're written at different times and they're emphasizing different aspects of the true story to motivate people in different ways. First and Second Kings tends to emphasize the evil of God's people and so to speak it provides a vindication of God sending them into exile. A vindication of God keeping his covenant promises to punish his people and also threads of hope that there can be repentance and a returning to the Lord. First and Second Chronicles writes to those that have already come back from exile and are living in their weakened state under the Persian emperor, and they're seeking to inspire, the writer's trying to inspire the people to remember all the mighty things that God did in the past and to be freshly motivated to line up with and fit in with their family tree. It'd be a little bit like if you imagine a young man hearing, say, in our country, I'm sure you've heard stories like this, your grandfather served, your great-grandfather served, your great-great-grandfather served, and what are you going to do as you head into this service? That there's something that motivates to live up to the heritage that we've been given. And that's what is happening in this book in general. And in this passage, nothing was more impressive to the writer of Chronicles that David and Solomon, the mightiest kings of the past, had accomplished than the building of God's temple. Now, that temple had been destroyed centuries before. 
it had, or hundreds of years at least, before, it had then been rebuilt in a reduced state, and they were living with a reduced temple. But certainly the people needed fresh motivation, and they want to be reminded of this great project of building the house of the Lord. Now, I want to get something out of the way right at the beginning. Since we're going to be talking about our generation's project so that nobody's distracted, we are not building a temple. Okay, so that is not the big reveal application at the end. I'm sure some Bible scholar out there, is he really going to make a case? No, no, no. We are not building a temple. This room is not a temple. There is no temple that is physical on this earth. And when we finally do build a building or buy a building, it won't be a temple. The temple is the people of God wherever they gather. That is the new temple established in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the chief cornerstone of that temple. That is the temple. And yet there is a continuity in the sense that what we give today goes towards the building, the care, the support of that temple, not the physical structure, but the people of God. We give in very much the same way that these people did, towards the dwelling place of God on earth, which is his people. And to see there to be a place where God's people reveal his glory. That, that's, that's a continuity here. And I think in the same way that the Chronicles generation needed to hear this inspiring story, we need to hear it as well. We need to be inspired by this story of our heritage. So what I want to do this morning is I want to walk through the story, first of all, and then I want to give four points of application after we do that. Let's just walk through the story first of all. David the king declares that Solomon, who God had chosen to be the builder of the temple, is young and inexperienced. David would not be allowed to build the temple because of his excessive violence in his life. And yet he is so passionate about this project that he has been gathering, we might call it an official building fund, so that when Solomon finally begins to build and he enters his kingship, all of the materials will be ready. And he can do it as, as swiftly and as effectively as he can. So David dedicates the latter portion of his reign, to preparing for this temple that he's not going to be allowed to see. He's not going to be alive to see, but he wants to prepare for it. He wants to sacrifice for it. He wants to give to it, and he wants to lead the people in giving to it. So he he begins to describe here this official fund. I think this is where this begins. He says, I have provided, in verse 2, for the house of my God so far as I was able, the gold for the things of gold, silver, bronze, and iron, and so forth, in great quantities, as well as precious stones. So he has accumulated over the years in this official fund great quantities of wealth, and even things like iron back then, what you can imagine, would have been incredibly valuable. That's why it's listed here right alongside gold and silver, because of an overwhelming desire to prepare and to be ready so when Solomon builds, all the things have been given, have been donated. He he also says, listen, I don't want you to think that this was just an official capacity. I I want to set an example for the people of God. So he says in verse 3, in addition to all that I have provided, that seems to speak of his official king capacity. He says, I have a treasure of my own. So this is David's personal wealth. He says, I have a treasure of my own of gold and silver, and because of my devotion to the house of my God, I give it to the house of my God. So David's saying, not only in my official capacity, and then I go home and enjoy all of my my money. He says, no, I'm so excited about this. I'm not trying to hold on to this wealth for my old age and prestige. I'm giving all of this wealth that I have gained over the years to this project that I will not see. And then he lists out the amount he is giving. 3,000 talents of gold. Now, you might have, as I do, a little note in your Bible to just give us some modern idea of what kind of money that is. A a talent is 75 pounds. A a A talent is 75 pounds. This is literally tons of gold. Tons. Elephants of gold. Massive. This is this is an incredible amount of gold. He says, I'm giving this gold, and, and gold of Ophir just means it's the best gold. 7,000 talents. Remember, a talent is 75 pounds. 7,000 talents of refined silver. I, I, I've given this because I am so passionate about the dwelling place of God on earth. I am so excited about this that this is absolutely the thing I want to do with my wealth. I, I just want to give it. I, I want to see my wealth built into the dwelling place of God on earth. I I, I want my treasure. This is where I want my treasure to go, David says. But his goal is not only to do this himself, 
He wants something for God's people. So look down there. You see at the end there of verse 5, he, he offers this invitation and call. Who then will offer willingly, and note this phrase, we'll come back to it, consecrating himself today to the Lord. Now the leaders probably as representatives, it, it's, it's not clear, we don't know for sure, but probably this is them representatively bringing the offerings of the people that they represent. The leaders respond, and they bring free will offerings, and they give an incredible amount as well, 5,000 talents that has been gathered. 10,000 derricks. A derrick was a Persian unit of money. It's one of the reasons we know this book was written after Darius, after the Persian Empire, because it would be as if we said today, uh, that's the equivalent of, of a million dollars or something. They're using their common terminology. A derrick wasn't around in David's time, but it was around when this book was written. So 10,000 derricks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, 100,000 talents of iron. Whoever had precious stones, you can imagine... You can think of, of Ken's excellent message about Mary and her family heirloom probably of ointment. Here, here's people bringing their family heirlooms of this precious jewel that they've kept for years. Precious stone that they have. There's no K jewelers in those days, right? You can't just walk over and buy something. This, this is something they've cherished probably. And here they say, I, can you use this? T take, take this emerald. T take this Ruby, it was my great-great-grandfather's. We, we've kept it for generations. Take, take this, and, and please take, take this diamond. Whoever, it says, had precious stones, gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord. The, the, the intention here is that we would be affected, as the first readers would have been, by the the surprising sacrifice, the degree of sacrifice, the passion for this building. This is not a people or a king that is giving spare change to this project. This is not a people who is saying, well, you know, that's true. We don't really need the extra goat. Uh, let's, let's give that to them. No, this, this is a people giving family treasures, historic treasures, generational treasures, we could even say. Life-altering treasures are being given to this project of building the house of God. And, and this results in a joy, a rejoicing. Somewhat ironically, it results in a rejoicing. There's a joy that takes place. Look down there at verse 9. Then the people rejoiced because they had given willingly. For with the whole heart they had offered freely to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. So as they bring in their treasures, and these are true treasures, incredible amounts of money and wealth, and the people who are reading this would have thought, wow, that's, that's not our, our way of thinking. Our inclination is here we are in this little pitiful leftover land that we're trying to scrape by, and we're in this not a very impressive season when the king of Persia still has a rule and domain over us. We've been knocked back and forth from different kingdoms like a hockey puck nation. And, 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 and gosh, you got to keep what you have because you don't know what's going to come next. You got to hold on to your treasures because you never know if, if the harvest is going to come in or if some other emperor is going to come rolling through here. This, this might be what you have to survive. So here, why are these people giving up all this money? That's why the writer is writing to reveal a kind of passionate, sacrificial, joyful, rejoicing in giving to the temple of God. Now David transitions in verse 10, and the writer wants to talk about his prayer that makes some theological points about what just happened. So this prayer kind of defines the event and, sh and kind of sets their frame of mind. So in verse 10, David blesses the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. A few points to note about this prayer. It, it begins with this absolute exaltation in the greatness and glory and power of God. David is absolutely determined that the people would hear and that God would hear that this event is for the glory of God. There, there is no boasting in what they have given. Quite the contrary. They, they want God to know. David wants God to know. And David wants the people to know that he knows this is not about me. 
And it's not going to be about Solomon, and it's not even about you. It is about the greatness of the glory of God. Just phrase after phrase, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all. Wouldn't you love to hear David's pastoral prayer? I mean, he is just proclaiming, it is to your glory, your glory alone, to the glory of God. This is for your glory. This, this rejoicing is for your glory. We, we, we rejoice. And, and he then says in verse 13 something we might think of as surprising. Now we thank you, our God. So for David, giving is an occasion for gratefulness. And then he explains in verse 14 why. Who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you and of your own we have given you. We are strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow and there is no abiding. So David <laughs> David reverses the modern preference for the self and the grandiose view we have of ourselves. David says, look, the, the amazing gift here is that you allow us to do this. It's a very different disposition where we tend to think, well, look, I'm, I'm doing you a favor. I'm helping you. David says, no, no, no. We are shadows and sojourners. The fact that we could give to God the eternal one who owns it all, and then he makes it explicitly clear, actually, what we're giving, it, it isn't even really ours. It's yours. Of your own we've given to you, he says. Of your own. He says, it all belongs to you. This money, this pile of treasure, I want to make it very clear. It was yours when we had it. You gave it to us. Our life is like a shadow, and so the fact that we get to be credited with giving it to you in any sense is a gift to us. It's an honor to us. It'd be as if, we might say, that a, a, a single blade of grass, just for a moment, gets to display the glory of an entire pasture. Or, or if a mirror just for a moment gets to display the glory of the sun. You say, well, it, it doesn't belong to me. It, it, it isn't mine. Yours is the glory. Yours is the power. Yours is the greatness. All this stuff belongs to you anyway. But for some reason, you've allowed us to be credited, so to speak, with giving you back what you gave to us in the first place. And, and, and this is a reason for our gratefulness to you. What, what does a shadow have in common with the sun if a shadow could reflect in a moment the brightness of the sun, the honor is to the shadow, he says. The honor is to the blade of grass. The honor is to the nothing that gets to touch for just a moment true glorious greatness. He's saying, we are grateful. We are grateful for this priv privilege, and we know it all comes from you, for the building you of a house for your holy name. He declares in verse 17 that the Lord knows that they have given out of the freeness and the uprightness of their heart. This isn't some kind of devious intention here. And that the people have offered joyously. And then he intercedes for the people for generations to come. He says in verse 18, Lord, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people. And direct their hearts toward you. David, I think, in that prayer is aware that the temptation of the people is not to rejoice and not to be grateful and not to be aware that all that they have, God has provided. That from one generation to the next, the perennial challenge is to assume that what God has given is meant to be used for our own luxury and indulgence and that giving is something that should credit us rather than a reason to be grateful and to be honored to think of our lives as something permanent and to be sheltered and protected rather than temporary, to be given. And he's aware, look, that's something, Lord, you have to keep in their hearts. David's vision, if we can put it that way, is to look into the future and say, Lord, keep them this way always. Here's a high moment, and you can, you can feel the emotion, even the writer of Chronicles looking at his own generation, and perhaps they were lacking or flagging in this kind of disposition. He's saying, oh, Lord, answer David's prayer in my own generation. 
Answer David's prayer, Lord, in my own generation. Keep this same heart that they are rejoicing and even grateful to be giving in this kind of abundance. Lord, keep them from the love of this world. Keep them from the love of money. Keep them from dedicating themselves to the idols of this earth. And, and cause them, Lord, to always be this way. And David prays, Lord, please cause the people to maintain this disposition, this sense of honor in giving. Cause them to see honor in giving from one generation to the next. Keep your people dedicated to you in this way. And the writer of Chronicles surely is, is praying that same thing for his generation as we ought to be praying for ours and for our own heart. Lord, keep, keep us in this way. And indeed, we have even more reason, I think, to desire to see that prayer fulfilled in our day because someone greater than Solomon has come. Someone greater than Solomon has come. As the Lord Jesus said himself, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And still today, as the Lord builds his church, Paul tells the Corinthians that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Because throughout every generation of God's people, he is still looking for those willing to consecrate themselves through financial giving to the temple work of the Lord. Michael Wilcox says this very well. He says, Who then will offer willingly, cried David in the day of the first temple, and the chronicler in the days of the second. The third temple, the New Testament one, is no longer a building, but a people. Yet, in its thoroughly practical need to be supported by gifts and cash and in kind, it provides the same down-to-earth test of true devotion to the Lord. We are 3,000 years removed from David's first call and 2,400 years removed from the call of the writer of the Chronicles. But still... Doesn't the call ring true in our day? Doesn't the need for it ring true in our day? So Jesus warned us in his teaching that we not use our money to invest in this age where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but still to invest in that age where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. So Jesus reminded us that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. So there is a tie that we see in 1 Chronicles between the person and the treasure that we see just reflected in the same way in different phrasing in the New Testament again. So even though we're not building a temple, the same spiritual realities exist in the hearts of God's people in every age. Now I think there are ongoing points to be made from this passage that I'd like to drive home regarding our call to fulfill in our day, in our church, this passage and the ongoing exhortation to rejoice in the honor of giving. First point, our giving is consecration. Our giving is consecration. Go back there to the end of verse 5, and I want to zero in on this phrase, who then will offer willingly consecrating himself today to the Lord? Consecrating himself. Notice the connection between the giving of our money and the declaration that we belong wholly to the Lord. There is a connection there. The Bible is not, this is a technical word, but it's not a Gnostic book, meaning that we, we don't separate out spirituality from our physical lives in this world. Those things are connected. Our physical lives, and in this case our money, is an expression, a real and true expression of our spiritual lives. So that there can be no sense of saying, I follow God spiritually, but not practically. There is no sense of that in the Bible. I honor God with my mind and heart, and it doesn't matter about my checkbook or my actions with my body. No, no. God made us to love him with heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so David can say, who will consecrate 
not just their money, but themselves. In a sense, we could say that he's saying in ahead of time what Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, because your heart is tied to your treasure. Who will offer themselves willingly. So our giving is consecration. Actually, there's even more of a deeper meaning if we could read it in the original Hebrew. J. Barton Payne explains this. He says, this phrase, consecrate himself, is a technical phrase used to describe ordination to the priesthood. And Scripture significantly places the act of giving on the same level of devotion. We might even use the word, who will ordain himself? This idea is that by giving, we are in that act, setting ourselves as those who have been set apart holy. The priests of the Old Testament people were not given an inheritance of land in the same way that the other tribes were because their inheritance was this calling to be solely and devoted to the Lord. They ministered to the Lord on behalf of the people and to the people on behalf of the Lord. That was their inheritance. So what he's saying is when we give, we're acting like priests who have been set apart to the Lord because our concern is not primarily with a physical inheritance in this age. It's concerned with being devoted to the Lord. So he's saying when you give, you're acting like a priest. You're even, we could put it this way, declaring yourself to be a priest. It's it's a remarkable phrase that David would use this in the assembly, especially in that era where priests were only to come from one tribe. That he would use that praise of saying, you, you, you have the chance to act like one who has been set apart with the honor where God is their inheritance. We get to the New Testament where Christ declares that every believer is a priest consecrated to the Lord through the finished work of Christ. And it makes this even more precious to act like a priest in the way that we give. To act like one who is not overly concerned with inheritance in this age, but is concerned with God who is our inheritance and with the building of his kingdom through the establishment of his church. Our giving is consecration. Giving is not separated from our heart. It reveals the dedication and the consecration of our heart. We cannot super-spiritualize our loyalty to God. The true test of our treasure is revealed in how we spend our money. Money never lies. Money always tells the truth. Money Always tells the truth. We could say it this way. Our money has our heart in it. It has our name on it. It is a declaration of our trust, our passion, our highest value. It is an indisputable revealer of what project we most want to call our own. Of what our highest vocation is. Is this true of us in our giving, our physical, monetary giving. Is that true of us? Are we comfortable with what our money, our giving, says of us right now? To be clear that this is not an exhortation towards extreme poverty, so to speak. That's not what we're doing here. It's, it's not saying that there's, we shouldn't feed our children because we should give that money to the Lord. Or we shouldn't have shelter because we should give all of that money to the Lord. Or there's, it's always we should feel guilty about any moment of enjoying good things in this life. That's, that's not what we're saying. God gave things for us to enjoy. But I think it's very likely that in our day and age and in our culture and our season, there's a need to ask the question. Is our standard of living based on biblical definitions of sufficiency to serve God? Or is it based on comparisons with the wealth of our culture? Do we think of standard of living as this is what we need to serve God joyfully in our life? Or do we think, well, this is reasonably restrained compared to the culture and how it lives? Do you see the difference? In those two categories, a Christian could say, well, I, I think I'm, I'm giving fine and I'm not living extravagantly compared to the culture. Or they could say, well, no, I'm, I, I, I am wanting to give as much as I can towards that thing which God is doing on earth, building his church. 
And to be very clear, if, there might be guests here or people listening to this. this. This is not just, can we get money in Redemption Hill? If you're at a different church, give to your church. Don't, don't give to this church. Give to your church where you're, where you're a part of that church and you're visiting here. Don't give here. Give to that church and minister to them. But it does reveal our consecration. I think this is important to us. We've been talking a lot about this in Mark, and Mark has just been determined. He keeps bringing this topic up again and again. Take up your cross. and The story of Mary and how she gives herself completely and the widow with her two mites. What's, he's trying to press to this issue of true discipleship means a consecration of the self that is revealed practically in real, sacrificial, joyful service of the Lord. Our giving is consecration. It is. It's not separated from our heart. It reveals our heart. Our heart is in our money. Secondly, our giving results in joy. Our giving results in joy. I I love verse 9. Just one of those hidden treasures in the Old Testament. Then the people rejoiced because they had given willingly. They had joy... Because they had given willingly with a whole heart, and David also rejoiced. Now, now why did they do that? Why did they have joy because they gave willingly? Well, I think there's a, a lot of reasons for that, but I think if we look broadly in the Scriptures, we can see why that is the case. Our hearts cling to money and to what money can do and buy and protect us from. And so when you give... You can give unwillingly because you're coerced. You'd really rather hold on to those things, but somebody makes you give. So taxes, say, might be a good example. Somebody makes you give, and you don't really want to give, but you give because you have to give. Mortgages, rent, bills, insurance. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm willing in a sense to give. But this seemed to be an, an enthusiastic... I, I'm excited to give. Why is that? Why, why is that present in the passage? Well, because it reveals that the heart really is dedicated to the Lord and not to those things. It does something to the person. The person is able to see, I do love the Lord. You know, in, in our day and age, there, there is what I might call an epidemic of massive overassurance. An epidemic of massive overassurance. Most people in this country have absolute confidence of their standing with God. At least that's what they would say. Absolute confidence. There would be a shock at the su- suggestion or possibility that they weren't true to the Lord. There would be a fence. How dare you even question that? Whatever you say of me, God knows that I am true to him. In most of the Bible, th- there, there is at least some level of a, a wisdom that says, you ought to want to know. You, this ought not to be something you assume. You ought not to assume that you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That ought not to be a, like you wake up in the morning, I am just doing great. Th- that shouldn't be the assumption of the heart. Man, I am one who loves God with all their heart. I am doing well. There ought to be some question, am I doing well? How do I know if I'm doing well? And the Bible does give some encouragement, not to be excessively concerned with our insurance, assurance, but to have some sense of our assurance, to be able to point to things like loving our brothers, like the confession of the faith, like attendance at the assembly of the church, like giving that gives assurance of our true devotion to the Lord. And so they're rejoicing, I think, partially, Because this reveals, and it reveals even to them. Yes, we are God's people. We do belong to him. We are faithful Israelites. No, we are not merely hypocrites who claim to belong to Yahweh, but actually belong to our treasures. No, we do, and you know how I know? I just gave them away. I just gave them away. Money is often for protection and pleasure, and sometimes worth. We actually use the word worth even in talking about people. What's their net worth? Well, they're a human being made in the image of God, 
and they're a Christian saved by Jesus. No, no, I, I mean, what's their net worth? Oh, you, oh, you mean their money. So you've connected worth to their money. That's downright biblical. Well, their money they've given to Jesus because he's their worth. Pleasure. This earth is full of good pleasures that we're meant to enjoy. But money gives us the possibility to enjoy them more and more and more. Protection. Who knows what the future holds? I mean, who knows what the future holds? And so money can represent safety. When you give away at any degree, and the more you give away, the more you feel this pleasure, worth, and protection that is represented by money, what are you saying? God is my worth. God is my pleasure. God is my protection. And you know what you get, what you get in exchange? Is you realize it is worth a lot more to belong to God than to have money. It's a lot more of a joyful thing to know God than to know the pleasures of this age. And it's a lot safer to belong to God than to have a lot of money. You know the joy of God's superiority from worth, pleasure, and protection, and therefore, you rejoice. You rejoice at the superiority of God over the idols that money represents. Now, I think we know this. At some level, we know this, but, but there's a little bit in our culture that sort of doesn't want to brag about being rich and doesn't want to explicitly say, I want to be rich, but really we kind of wink that we all kind of do. I was thinking about a country song that I heard from this point that illustrates this perfectly. He says, I ain't rich, but I sure want to be. So don't think less of me, because I'm not actually rich, because we don't like rich people, but We'd like to be rich. Working like a dog all day ain't working for me. I wish I had a rich uncle that had kicked the bucket. Sorry to the uncle. <laughs> and that I was sitting on a pile like Warren Buffett. I know everybody says money can't buy happiness. Then he gets to his main chorus. But it could buy me a boat. It could buy me a truck to pull it. It could buy me a Yeti iced down with some adult beverages. Yeah, I know what they say, money can't buy everything. Well, maybe so, but it could buy me a boat. Well, there's nothing wrong with having a boat. Don't walk out of here and say, John says Christians don't have trucks or boats. <laughs> but there is something. I, I remember hearing that, and, and if I remember correctly, I, I chuckled as you would. It's a clever song. But I thought, yeah, that chuckle there is something true. It resonates in my heart. I actually don't think I'm rich, even though compared to most people in the world, I'm absurdly rich. And actually, if you talk to rich-er people, some of them might not think they're rich. There's always somebody richer than me who's rich. And I maybe wouldn't say I'm rich, but if I'm honest, I'm kind of like that guy. Trucks are cool. I'd like a nicer car. <laughs> I'd like a nicer something. I'd like a nicer TV, nicer house, nicer vacation. Just a little bit nicer. Not crazy nice where I stand out, but nicer. A little bit longer vacation, a little bit more money, a little bit nicer college. Could use a little bit nicer wardrobe, just a little bit nicer. A little bit nicer jewelry. Because we're in the this range, and I like to do this range for my wife at Christmas. A little bit, a little bit nicer. Just, and they can buy me that stuff. So why are they rejoicing? Because there is a joy in knowing when it goes away, God is better. There it goes. <laughs> oh, that's a car payment. There it goes. Mm. 
there's an extra bedroom. There's an extra acre. There's an extra vacation. There's an extra necklace. There's an extra couple years before retirement. They're staying in the same house in retirement. There it goes. And God is better. And in that, I rejoice. God loves a cheerful giver. Our giving results in joy. Point number three, our giving flows out of God's generosity. I think David's reminder in his prayer is good for us. All that we have comes from the Lord. All that we have comes from the Lord. We are a shadow, a sojourner on this earth. It's gone. It is gone. I recently was noticing a commercial that's been making its way around. It it says something like, you can't live forever, but you can try. I was like, that's dumb. (laughs) Can you imagine if we did that to other stuff? You can't jump off a building and fly, but you can try. That's stupid. You can't live forever, but you can try. You know what that's really saying? Since you can't live forever, make the most of this temporary life and try to ignore that death comes to all. That's what it's really saying. What the Bible says is, actually, you are going to live forever, so stop worrying about not living forever, but you aren't going to live temporarily in this world. Very temporarily, very briefly. It's going to be like a shadow sojourner. You're just somebody passing through. You are passing through. You know those old westerns? The guy comes in. What are you doing here, stranger? I'm just passing through. (laughs) That's us. We're passing through. We're passing through. We're not setting up permanent shop. We don't have a kingdom. We're not looking to build a us plantation on this world that we can live in for endless ages. No, no, no. We are passing through. Through. We are a shadow. We're not a permanent shining light that people can warm themselves around. No, we are passing through. We are passing through. And all that we have while we're passing through comes from the Lord. It comes from the Lord. And the main goal of it is to see whether we will recognize we are passing through and that he is worth it all. The main goal of passing through, you know, the main goal of your life is to reveal whether you love your life more than God or God more than your life. That's the main goal of passing through. It's just a quick snap. It's snap. It's gone. It's gone. But there's something you can do in it. You can declare, but you are eternal. You can connect to that. You're not a worthless passing through. You have a chance to do something. You have a chance to... Be connected to the thing that is eternal. To contribute to the eternal thing. And even to contribute to something that will last in this age longer than you. To say, look, I I get to put my mark on something that will last in this age longer than you. You're you're passing through, but, but here is something that's eternal. And before God, I get to say, all that I have comes from you. You've given it to me to reveal that I'm just passing through and that you are worth all the glory. It belongs to you. Listen, we get in a lot of trouble when we start thinking, look at my stuff. Look at my treasures. Look at all my things that I have. It would be much wiser for, like David said, gods, 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 gods. Okay, God, what would you like me to do today with this stuff that's yours? Here it is. It's your stuff. It's your stuff. It's your house. It's your life. It's so quick. It'll be gone. It's your stuff. What, in the meantime, what do you want me to do? I, I'm, I'm just passing through. Where, where should I unload this stuff while I'm passing through? You've handed me stuff. What do you want me to do with it? You've handed me money. I'm, I'm just passing through. Who do you want me to throw it at while I'm passing through? I'm passing through this town. I got, I got a wad of cash. I'm passing through. Who, where, which, 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 where, that store, that store, that store, that store for this horse. You know, and you know, you know what he says? Give to the eternal things. 
There's one deposit where you'll see that treasure again. Give to the eternal things. Our giving flows out of God's generosity. When we know that, it frees us to give. Because it's not ours in the first place. It's his. And he gives so that we would give. So that we would provide for our families, yes. And so that we would give. Finally, our giving is inspired by our king's greatest gift. By our king's greatest gift. When the writer of Chronicles points back to David and his overwhelming personal example, he's pointing to the greatest king he could think of. He's like, you know what David did. Let's remember David, the great king David. We have a better king to point back to. We have a better king. Now, David is an impressive king in his leadership of the people as he sets the pace for his people, reveals in his own sacrifice his devotion to the building of the house of God. 3,000 talents of gold and silver and all this stuff. I've given my own because of my devotion to the work of the Lord. But we can point back to a greater king who gave a greater treasure Because he gave himself to build the temple that we get to contribute to. We get to point back to a greater king. They had to be inspired by David, and they should have been in that post-exilic Jerusalem community to give to support the work of the second temple. Yes, I hope they were motivated to do that. But we get to point back to Jesus, who is the cornerstone of the new temple and laid it through his death on the cross and his resurrection. We get to look at him and say, if he gave his life for the building of his people, then we surely can offer ourselves willingly as well. Who, in light of what our king has done, the New Testament might rewrite this, can offer themselves willingly? Who, in light of the cross, can offer themselves willingly? Who, in light of Christ Jesus, can offer themselves willingly? Who, in light of our great cornerstone, can offer themselves gladly, sacrificially, willingly, eagerly to the building of the temple that he died to build? David Wilcock says this again, the chronicler is once more driving home the perennial lesson, who then will offer willingly? There is no generation of God's people, least of all our own, who can afford to sidestep the issue. Although so much has changed in the world, still the challenge is here to be accepted for the work of God, for the benefit of the temple, which is his people. Are we prepared to give, to give the gold and silver and precious stones and to give the whole heart? In the words of 29.5, who then will offer willingly, consecrating himself today to the Lord? And I would add, who in light of the cross of Jesus Christ is willing to consecrate themselves to the building of his temple? Who then is willing? From our king, we hear the call. I, he says, lay down my life for the sheep. I pay the ransom for sinners. I am the stone the builders rejected that became the cornerstone of the new temple. So, like Mary, since we are aware of his worth, and more than Mary, since we are aware of his death and the meaning of it, as we await his return, we should joyfully offer willingly to the Lord, sacrifices that reflect the worth of what he did on the cross and the people he died to save. I pray that our church from one generation to the next will be known as fulfilling David's prayer that this heart of giving, this passing through mentality, this sense that God owns it all, And we can contribute to the building of his church. I pray that that heart, especially focused on the Lord Jesus Christ, would be true of us. In this building drive that we're currently doing in our generation for generations to come. In our ongoing giving to the church. In our generosity for the sake of his glory. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for the giving of yourself for our salvation. And I thank you, Lord, that by your grace, you have set us free from the grip of the idols of this age. And Lord, I pray that we would count ourselves dead 
to the sins of this age and count ourselves alive to you. Lord, that wherever there is materialism or greed or fear or idolatry, that you would mortify that in our hearts and that you would replace them with generosity and mercy and eagerness and joy in the building of your temple and your kingdom. I pray there would be a heavenly mindedness about this church that looks ahead and sees our promised land and the great day we will see you face to face as as the thing we are living for, the thing we are giving towards, that, Lord, we would love the proclamation of your gospel and the service of your church and the care of your people more than we love our own comfort and protection. Lord, I pray you would do this among us. Lord, cause us to be a giving church. Lord, in, in our own ministries and in various ministries around the world, cause us to give eagerly, joyfully, willingly, to experience the joy of knowing you are worth it. You are better. Do this in our heart, I pray. In Jesus' name.